and welcome everybody to FanStream Sports powered by DSP Media. This is the Fighting Irish Day Blitz, and I'm your host, Rob Fedoff, also known as RPT. You can find me on X at P Fedoff. Head over to our website at fanstreamsports.com for all additional podcast information. If you have an Apple device or an Android device, please feel free to download the FanStream Sports app. Please feel free to share that with your friends and family. So for this podcast here, we're Really quickly approaching the Notre Dame football season, especially practice training camp. I believe that starts in about two and a half, three weeks. I'll have a prediction show or a preview show at some point. But for this podcast here, I wanted to add a pop culture reference here to kind of compare what I'm going to talk about Notre Dame wise to what happened in pop culture 40 years ago. So Notre Dame, as we all know, as we approach the 2024, 2025 season, It'll be 36 years since we last won our national, the last national title. That's way too long. But also 40 years ago, especially the summer of 1984, there was a phenomenon happening, whatever you want to call it, that was going on too. I want to kind of compare those two subjects to say, are we are we closer to Notre Dame winning the national title in football, or what happened in pop culture 40 years ago, which I'll explain a little bit later. So let's just kind of do a brief. Well, it's not going to be brief, but uh, well, the last two seasons will be brief here. 2022, 2023, Marcus Freeman takes over. It's been some ups and downs lately, but for all the good Notre Dame coaches, they really hit it in that third year. Dan Devine won a national title. Lou Holtz won a national title. Eric Parsegian won a national title. Even Brian Kelly, he didn't win a national title, but he took the team to the national championship game. And this is, to me, a make-or-break season for Marcus Freeman because, for one— the playoffs, you only had to be in the top 12 to make the playoffs. So it's going to be easier to make the playoffs. But to me, it's going to be a little bit tougher because even if Notre Dame's the number one team in the nation, since they're not in a conference for football, the highest they can be seated is fifth. So they'll have to win four games to win a national title instead of if they were a top four seed and in a conference, they'd only have to win three games. So we'll see how that happens. But let's just kind of give a review of since that 1988 season. So to me, 88 to 93 was the holy grail for Notre Dame football in my lifetime. 88, we won the national title. And really, we just had two tough games. Both of those games, we won by one point. The first game, we beat Michigan 19 to 18. Michigan misses a field goal at the end of the game. It was a long field goal, don't get me wrong, but Mike Gillette has made those field goals field goals before. We have a walk-on kicker. The kid's barely five feet tall. Reggie Ho ends up becoming a cardiologist. If we do not have Reggie Ho during that game, we do not win the game. And then also, we won. We beat Miami October the 15th, 1988. Obviously, the Catholics versus Convicts game. To me, that was the greatest game I've ever seen, at least Notre Dame-wise, if not just college football in general. Won that game 31-30. to And after that, it was, I don't want to say it was smooth sailing, but we pretty much... Uh, took care of business throughout the season. We did have a uh, a matchup with USC at the end of the year where they were number two. However, we pretty much manhandled them. I think we won that game 27 to 10. I may be off on that, but it was not close. And then we won the national title against West Virginia in the Fiesta Bowl 34 to uh, 21. And it wasn't even that close. So we win the national title in 1988. The next season, 89, the team's probably better, especially talent-wise. However, we end up going into South Beach, rematch against Miami. They're hungry to uh, to get revenge against us. And we end up losing that game 27 to 10. And even Lou Holtz will say that he had the team too tight. He did not want any sort of fights before the game, like the Catholics versus Convicts game. He should have just let these kids be loose and ready. They were not and ended up losing that game. But Luke, Lou Holtz really takes responsibility for that game, saying, had he just let them be who they were, they probably win that game. And I agree as well. Even though the game was at Miami, I think we were a better team than Miami that year. However, uh, right after New Year's, we end up beating a number one Colorado team, 21-6 to in the Orange Bowl. However, Miami ends up winning the national title. We finish it up number two. A lot of controversy behind that. Then the 1990 season, opened the season number one. However, we had a kind of a hiccup game against Stanford, lost that game at home. And then we played Penn State. Uh, the Rocket gets hurt that game. We lose that game. And then we also, you know, we're still kind of in the hunt for a national title, heading into a rematch in the Orange Bowl against Colorado that season or that 
bowl season. That's the game where we're down 10 to nine and Rocket Ismail runs that punt return back, but there's that fandom holding call or clip call. They bring it back. Colorado ends up beating us. We finished the season nine and three, but still a solid season. And we were in the hunt for the national title for the majority of the season. 91 was kind of a weird year where I ended up playing Michigan. That's the year Desmond Howard was uh, won the Heisman Trophy. And we had not uh, lost to Michigan in a while. And Michigan, you had to think they were due to beat us. They did beat us. And then we were playing Tennessee. This is another game where I think Lou Holtz kind of takes responsibility too. They had finals that week. They were kind of tired. They were dominating Tennessee. Ended up getting a, a kick blocked right before the end of the half. They run it back. And then all hell breaks loose. And we end up losing pretty significantly to, I believe it was about 15 to 18 points to Tennessee. And then the next week, they're still kind of reeling from that loss. Go down to Penn State. And Lou Holtz, that was one of the teams he kind of struggled with at Notre Dame. He only finished 3-3 three and three against Joe Paterno. Lose pretty uh, pretty convincingly to, uh, to Penn State that game. And then head into the Sugar Bowl 8-3. and three. And There was always that joke where Notre Dame was having dinner and the waiter comes up to Lou Holtz and says, what's the difference between Notre Dame and Cheerios? Being Cheerios belong in a bowl. However, despite that season being kind of up and down and not being in the national title hunt the entire year, we come back and beat a really good Florida team in the Sugar Bowl. That's the game where I believe Jerome Bettis just goes off in that second half, has three touchdown, uh, three touchdowns in the game, three long touchdown runs, that is. We win that game 39 to uh, 28, and that propels us for the 92 season. To me, you've heard me say this before. That team, to me, is the most talented uh, Luke Holtz team at Notre Dame, but tied Michigan, had another kind of just weird game, kind of like the Tennessee game the year before. We're dominating Stanford in the first half. And then I, maybe that, yeah, I think, no, that wasn't, uh, I'm trying to think it's something that happened right before the half, but I don't believe anything did. But then second half, they just took it to us. That was a weird game too, because Bill Walsh had taken over at Stanford after he so-called retired from the San Francisco 49ers, but he did the, the the analysis for Notre Dame games uh, after his retirement, before he got back into coaching at Stanford. And it seemed like he was never a fan of Lou Holtz. And I think he really wanted to win that game. And I think, too, he kind of owned Lou Holtz during that game. And we ended up losing to Stanford. That took us out of the national title race. However, we ended up beating Penn State. That was the snowball game. Great game. I know I said before that Lou Holtz struggled against Penn State, but that was one of the games we did beat Penn State. And ended up finishing that year 10-1-1, and annihilated Texas A&M in the Cotton Bowl. And had we not had that tie against Michigan and that really that hiccup game against Stanford, I think we were one of the best teams in the nation that year. And had we been playing for the national title, I even think Reggie, I was going to say Reggie Bush. No, that's USC. I think Reggie Brooks would have won the Heisman. He averaged about 8.1 yards per carry that year i believe that tied george gip but that team was really better than what the record showed and then 93 headed in uh, beat a number one florida state team that team really reminded me of the 88 season so everything's setting up perfect we beat florida state they were the number one team in the nation we number two that was the game of the century beat them 31 to 24 however the next week against boston college it's finals week and even lou holtz will tell you he probably should have managed that a little bit better. They were mentally fatigued. Boston College jumps out on us to a 21-point lead. We make a great – that would have been – had we won that game, it would have been one of the greatest comebacks in Notre Dame history. Take the lead 39-38. to We kick off. We tackle them before they even reach the 20-yard line. However, we have an unsportsmanlike uh, conduct call. And then we have to give them another 15 yards there. But here's the – Here's the kicker right here. The next play, or one of the or it's second to last, or it's the second to next play after that unsportsmanlike call, Pete Bursich, linebacker for Notre Dame, has an easy interception. It's right in his hands. Right in his hands. He drops it. The drive continues. They kick that field goal and win 41 to 39. We do beat uh, Texas AM in the Cotton Bowl 24 to 21. That was a pretty big bowl win. 
However, we finished number two in the nation behind Florida State, despite beating them 31-24. to 24. And that kind of begins this Notre Dame curse, if you want to call that. So I'm going to kind of go through real quickly here after the 93 season. So Ron Paulus comes in. He's actually, the previous season, he would have been the starter, but broke his arm. He's supposed to win two Heisman Trophy. He doesn't even come close to that. 94 is a mediocre year. 95 and 96 was okay. 97, okay. Lou Holtz retires. We get Bob Davey. He'll have a good season, bad season. Good season, bad season. Pretty much for five years, he gets fired. And then we get Tyrone Willingham. Actually, we get George O'Leary, but he lies on his resume and he doesn't take the job. Or uh, I don't know, he doesn't, I don't know how you can say that, but he more or less resigns from Notre Dame because he lied on his resume is what I'm trying to say. Then you get Tyrone Willingham. Starts out pretty good, 8-0, but then the wheels kind of come off. Two mediocre se- mediocre seasons after that. And then we get Charlie Weiss. Have really two solid seasons, 2005-2006, with Brady Quint, the quarterback. Stud quarterback, big man on campus. However, he has the shittiest defense to back him up. It would have been nice to see him with a solid defense. Had they had that, especially in 2005, I think they compete for a national title. Whether they win it, I don't know. But I think they they come close. And then you see, even though Charlie Weiss is maybe a, a really good, I don't want, I want to call him a great coordinator, but a solid offensive coordinator, strategist, whatever you want to call it, we find out he's not a really good teacher in the college ranks. And you really have to be a really good teacher and develop players despite some really good recruiting classes. But a lot of those recruiting classes, too, were just skilled players, the Jimmy Clausens and the Michael Floyds. After that 2006 season, 07, 08, and 09, mediocre at best, and then he finally gets fired. And then Brian Kelly uh, joins Notre Dame. Say what you want about Brian Kelly. He kept it pretty consistent at Notre Dame with solid success. Didn't win a national title. We did get to the national championship game in, in 2012. And then in 2018 and then in 2020, he took us to the playoffs as well, but never really could get over that hump. Really had a couple kind of so-so seasons. He only really had, if you want to take away those so-so seasons, just one really bad season. That was the 2016 season. And that was a lot of his fault. A lot of his fault because he hired his buddy, Brian Van Gorder, who's an awful offensive coordinator, finished the season four and eight. What I'm trying to say, if you take, Everything after 93, 2002, somewhat close, but the wheels kind of fell off. 05 and 06, would have liked to have seen a decent defense with those Brady Quinn teams. And then 2012, went to the national title, got blitzed by Alabama. And then 2018, 2020, really had no business playing Clemson. Trevor Lawrence just really took it to us. But I think 2020... I don't think anybody was going to beat that Alabama team, but we we held our own. We I know we lost by 17 points, but that was the closest anyone got to Alabama. I mean, Ohio State lost by 28 in the national title game. So that was, even though you don't want to, you know, close is only good in horseshoes, we were getting closer. And now, I we'll, we'll see this year. I mean, if we do not make the playoffs, that's going to be an issue right there. But this is where I get in my pop culture reference. So are we closer to winning a national title in football or this pop culture reference I'm going to uh, mention right now? So uh, I'm a big movie guy, not so much a music guy. Anyone that knows me, I, I probably would never pay for a concert at this point unless Frank Sinatra came back from the dead. I'm a big, I'm an old soul. So I would love to see Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack during their heyday. Obviously that cannot happen. But if there was a... What, what do they call those groups that imitate? I've, I've been to one of those concerts in Las Vegas, but a, a tribute band, that's the word I'm looking for. If there's a tribute band, I would go to that. But really, any other concert right now, I think, even if I did like music right now, I think a lot of music's just really bad right now. A lot of it's just copycat type music. But the only person, there would be one person I'd pay for right now, and he's not really mainstream. He's kind of mainstream, but not really mainstream. I don't think you really hear him on the radio. But Gary Clark Jr., for those of you have heard of him, to me, he's like a like a Jimi Hendrix type. He did a, a cover of the song Come Together from the Beatles back in 2016 for the movie Justice League. If you search on it YouTube, he did it on the Howard Stern Show Live. Excellent, excellent remake of the Come Together song from the Beatles. But he's like a blues, 
rock type singer, kind of like a Jimi Hendrix. He plays his own instrument, writes his own songs pretty much. But Gary Clark Jr., I would pay to see him. But I digress right there. But so 40 years ago today, the summer of 84, the movies that were out right now, it was just incredible. The amount of, I'll, I'll do, I'll go to my cheat sheet right here just to, before I get to my main subject here. So if you look at the movies of the summer of 1984, we'll never, I don't know if we'll ever see this again. Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Gremlins, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, The Karate Kid, one of my favorite movies of all time, The Natural, Purple Rain, Breaking In, even though uh, breakdancing was really popular during that time. And this movie was popular at the time too, but I think now it'd probably just go right to streaming. But it finished number eight for the year. And that's insane when you think about it. Bachelor Party, Romancing the Stone, Conan the Destroyer, The Last Starfighter, Red Dawn, Tightrope, one of the most underrated Clint Eastwood movies out there. Police Academy, 16 Candles, Rhinestone. I, when I think about Rhinestone, it was a, it was a commercial flop bomb but it's still i don't want to say well really it made some money but critically i should say it was a, it was a flop it was not a good sylvester stallone moment with dolly parton let's just put it that way and then footloose the, what i'm going to talk about pretty soon here uh finished 28th that that year and then what else do we have here just as as i look at this and that's about but as you can see they're just tremendous year especially summer for movies but Footloose, I just mentioned that right there. They had a soundtrack that was just, even though, like I said, I'm not a big movie fan or, or a soundtrack fan, was incredible. Every single song on that soundtrack was a hit. The only other soundtrack I can think of that even kind of compares The Bodyguard with Whitney Houston back in late 1992, I think that had about four to five hit songs on there. Top Gun had a couple songs on that soundtrack. But if you look at Footloose, as I look here, they had one, two, three, four, five, six, nine hit songs from that soundtrack. Four, or I'm sorry, so six of the six of the Billboard Hot 100s. Let me say that again: six Billboard Hot 100 top 40 hits were from the Footloose so soundtrack. Let me repeat that again: six Billboard Hot 100 top 40 hits were from that soundtrack. Three were in the top 10 and two number one hits. That being Footloose from Kenny Loggins, the, the title song. And then let's hear it from the boy from Denise Williams. But let me just tell you right now. So the original release of the soundtrack, you had Footloose by Kenny Loggins. Then let's hear it for let's hear it for the boy Denise Williams. Almost Paradise by Mike Reno from Loverboy and Ann Wilson. Holding out for a hero by bonnie tyler dancing in the sheets by shalimar i'm free he heaven helps the heaven helps the man kenny loggins some somebody's eyes carla uh, Bor bonoff's her name i believe but it was a it was a hit let's just put it that way the girl gets around sammy hagar and then never by moving pictures that's the real cheesy i said footloose is one of my favorite movies but that, that's the one that cheesy scenes where uh, Kevin Bacon, Ren is his name in the movie. He's all pissed off that he can't dance in the town. And uh, he's having issues with his, even though he's not her, it's not his girlfriend yet, but her preacher uh, father. So he goes out to this warehouse and starts dancing and doing all these gymnastics. It's a cheesy scene, but it's totally 80s. But it, it just makes Footloose for the, the great movie that it is. But then in 1998, this is what I don't get right here. They end up re-releasing the movie a re-release in the soundtrack and calling it the 15th anniversary. I don't know. The last time I checked my math, 84 and 98 is 14 years. They call it the 15th year anniversary. So someone's math's off there, but I digress. They end up, these four songs were in the movie, but they weren't in the soundtrack, but they ended up putting them in the soundtrack anniversary. And these four songs too were big songs at the time. Or hit songs at the time, I should say. So Bang Your Head, Metal Health by Quiet Riot. Hurt So Good by John Mellencamp. Or John Cougar Mellencamp at the time. Whatever you want to say. Waiting for a Girl Like You by Foreigner. And then that other song that was in the original 
soundtrack, Dancing in the Sheets by Shalimar. They remixed it. They kind of made a remix. That was big back in the day, too. So having said that, let's just not even count the remix. 12 hit songs. Nine originally. And then, I'm sorry, no, eight originally. No, let me tell. Let me see this again. Nine songs, and they added three. I'm not counting that fourth remix. So it is 12. So nine original, and then three when they re-released it. 12 hit songs in a soundtrack. I don't know if we'll ever see that again. I know Notre Dame hasn't won a national title in 19, since 1988, but for a soundtrack to have nine original songs be all hits, you heard them on the radio, and then, like I said, six were in the Billboard Top 100, Top 40, three ranked in the Top 10, and then two number one hits. That's... that. And just in general, too, you really don't see with movies now, and I know a lot of, a lot of movies have gone to streaming. Soundtracks back in the day were a big thing. You would always, uh, you know, Eye of the Tiger for Meraki 3. That was always three. That was always the thing to have back in the day is to have at least one song from a movie hit it pretty big. You don't even see that nowadays at all. But to have 12 hit songs, nine from the original soundtrack, that, that's saying something right there. So what I'm trying to say is here, will we see a Notre Dame national title first or a soundtrack like Footloose? Even though I think it's going to be harder for Notre Dame to win a national title with this new format, easier to make the playoffs. I've said that before. I got to say, I think Notre Dame wins a national title before we see a soundtrack like Footloose again. But how long is that going to be? Is it going to be five years, 10 years? I'm hoping it's this year. I'm hoping it's in the next year, but we'll see how that goes. But I just kind of wanted to have that little pop culture reference in there with the Notre Dame uh, national title drought since 1988. But yeah, Footloose, 1984, just that summer of 1984. It was a great time to be a kid, especially with movies. Just It was just a totally different, different vibe back then. If, if you went to the movie theater to have all those movies in a row, now you just see a lot of, a lot of kids' cartoon movies that parents take them there to more or less just babysit the kids for a good hour and a half, two hours. And movies, it's just not like the same going to the movie theater. I mean, I, I still enjoy movies and stuff like that, but it's just not, even 15, 20 years ago, it's still not the same because a lot's gone to streaming. You don't really have those soundtrack uh, songs anymore. So I got to say, I do not think whoever, I do not think we'll see nine hit songs and then three added to the soundtrack so 12 hit songs more or less i don't think we'll ever see that again i think we'll see a notre dame national title before that i just don't know when i'm hoping it's sooner than later but we shall see so thank you so much for joining me for joining me for episode 138 and as always go irish <laughs>